God created heaven and earth. That's the title of the book. And so here you also have, um, in the Hebrew title, uh, these are the names. And immediately what you have when you read the book of Exodus, you immediately have a connection with the sons of Jacob. These are the 12 sons of Jacob. They're going to form the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, so there's this connection between Genesis and Exodus. Exodus begins in the Hebrew word and to show uh, it is a continuation of Genesis. But it's definitely a new phase in the life of Israel. Now, the Greek titles is Exodus, a word meaning exit, departure, or going out. The Septuagint, using the word, is described the book uh, by the key events, also gone out. And then in Luke chapter 9, verse 31, and Second Peter chapter 1, verse 15, the word Exodus is used in the New Testament, but it speaks about the physical death of Peter and Jesus. So we Exodus from this world, and we go into the next. This embodies Exodus' theme of redemption, because redemption is accomplished only through death. And then, of course, there's other. The Latin um, Vulgate is the book of departure, taken from the Greek, if you are interested in that. So just to know that in the Hebrew Bibles, the names of the Bibles might be different, because they use the first sentence. When it comes to author, and this is really where things start getting very exciting, um, there are many critics against the Bible. Uh, liberal scholars in places called theological training institutes, uh, but actually the way they train is to dismantle scripture. So in the Old Testament, liberals would say that the first five books of uh, the Bible, the Pentateuch, the law, um, that wasn't really written by Moses. Now, that's the, the criticism of liberals. In the New Testament, it's the same criticism. They would say that the New Testament wasn't really written by the apostles. Now, if that can be proven right, if that can be proven right, there's no point in having the scriptures there. Then everything is undone. So the critics have challenged the, mo the, the mosaic authorship of Exodus, and so too Genesis and the rest, in favor of a series of oral written documents that were woven together by editors late in Israel's history to make up the story. Their arguments are generally weak and far from conclusive, especially in view of the strong external and internal evidences that points to Moses as the author. Now, this might sound strange to you at first because maybe you've never sat in a theology class where you will do this kind of thing, but please bear with me and be patient with yourself. And um, when we talk about external evidences, uh, we are talking about evidence outside of the book of Exodus, but in the Bible. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So, there are evidences right through Scripture to show that the book of Exodus was written by Moses. So, for instance, in Exodus 20, verse 25, it says, when you build an altar, you won't use chisels and a hammer. Uh, it will be bare rock. Now, it's interesting when you see pictures of altars in children's book. Oh, they're beautifully chiseled, and they just look so attractive. Okay, But the same exact thing is, is uh, reported or repeated in Joshua chapter 8, verse 30 to 32. So we see in the book of Joshua that it's attributed to a different author, that it is attributed to Moses. Other biblical writers attribute Exodus to Moses. In Malachi, it's the, the last book in the Old Testament, it attributes the, 
uh, the exodus to Moses and the law. Uh, the disciples in John chapter 1 verse 35, Paul in Romans chapter 10 verse 5, and also the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just think of that for a moment. If Jesus was wrong, that means he, no word of his can be trusted. So he attributes the book of Exodus to Moses. And of course the Jewish and Samaritan traditions consistently hold to the Mosaic authorship of Exodus. Just a word on that. Something that we might not know. But um, with the, the split of Israel, the ten northern tribes, and then later on the third going into Exodus, there were still Jewish people remaining in Samaria. We know about that from Je uh, John chapter 3 and 4, the woman at the well. They had their own religious system. Up to this day, you can go to YouTube, I usually don't do this, but you can go Sumerian worship, uh, temple worship. They have that, and they would say Moses is the basis for their worship. And of course, we know also with um, the Jews, um, they kept all these things very pure. The Sumerians integrated it with other um, false religions, but the Jews seek to keep it pure. So outside of the book of Exodus, right through scripture, you have that. And if that is wrong, then we can just burn our Bibles. The Bible is not true. So do you see how important the book of Exodus is? How important the book of Genesis is? So when people argue about creation in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and they say, oh, it's no big deal. You can kind of keep to uh, evolution, what they are doing is just dismantling. Because Jesus spoke about the creation in six days. And he was speaking in a New Testament context, which means that the six days could not have been long periods of time. Jesus would have said it. He used the word for days um, a few thousand years later. So the moment we start tampering, bringing in our evolutionary ideas, or trying to read the Bible through liberal scholars, we start losing uh, confidence within the scriptures. What about some internal evidences? Well, I've, I will send this, this um, information to you. But um, let us turn to some text just to see inside of the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 to 14, we have um, direct um, attributes that are made to Moses being the author, and he is right there involved. In verse 8 to 14, it says, Then uh, Amalek came, fought against Israel and Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Chosen men, uh, uh, choose men for us and go out, uh, fight against Amal uh, Amalek. Uh, tomorrow I will station myself on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So we can see that Moses is recording this as the events happen. He's actually recording it, writing down, maybe in our modern day, diary form, and then later on, just before um, they enter into the promised land, he edits the whole thing. Israel has all the information. I mean, he had 40 years to do it. And some people would say it's just not possible. Do you think it's possible in 40 years? Oh, very much so. And guided by the Holy Spirit, he is giving this evidence. So we see Moses is very much involved in the text. And as these events happen, he records it. So Moses' usual procedure was to record events soon after they occurred in the form of historical uh, uh, when they happened. And then it's clear from Exodus that he would later edit it. He will be an eyewitness. And also what you pick up just studying his insight that Moses was an educated man. He had information about customs, about climate, about plants, about animals, the wilderness. 
Uh, he was at university in Egypt. He was trained in a pagan university. He was a very educated man. God prepared him uh, so that he and uh, set him aside so that he would be the one who will write down this information for um, the future. Also, what we find within the book of Exodus, the proof that it was written by Moses, is that the style is consistent. And development also points to a single author. It's, um, and um, you can see the, the style, the way it's put down there. This is Moses writing this. The date and setting, this is very interesting too. When you go to the Middle East, um, you would, like in the West, you will go, you get to Niagara Falls, and there's a placard there, uh, and then it would say, uh, 45 million years ago, this process started, and so on, so on, so on, so on. Okay, that's in the West, evolutionary idea. When you go to the Middle East and you travel around there and you look at buildings, there will also be these placards. And there will be a, the dates that they give you will not be correct. So Egyptologists, people, archaeologists, they have a time frame and they would work according to that calendar. Now you can hear there are two different dates about the um, of the event, the exodus. There's the, there's the 1445 before Christ, and then there's the, that's the biblical date, and then there's the Egyptologist, that is 250 years, they take away from that date. So, when you speak to them, and I posted something on LBC Interactive, I don't know if you saw that video, you actually hear them speak and say, um, there is no evidence that the exodus happened. That is, if you believe in that the exodus took place in 1230 before Christ, there's no evidence. But there's masses of evidence that exist when you take the year 1450. Evidences of where they lived, graves, you have the grave of Joseph. Um, that's of course broken because they took his body with. All that is pointing that there are external evidences outside in Egypt that shows that um, the exodus happened um, 1,450 years before Christ. Now, the 250 years difference make a huge difference. Now, if any of you are interested to watch a documentary, um, I will share the link with you if you ask me, but I'm not going to post it. Um, our Bible school is accredited with a Brooks Bible College, and they work with the guy that did the, that did the documentary. And I will send it to you if you promise me not to send it to other people. And it died. The, the YouTube link, or whatever link it will be, will die with you. Okay? So you can look at the, the, the stuff that I've posted on Interactive. So I've, we've already seen that Moses kept an account which he edited in the plains of Moab short, shortly before his death. And so Exodus covers the period from the arrival of Jacob in Egypt uh, to the erection of the tabernacle 431 years later in the wilderness. You just, that is the, that is the spans. The theme and purpose there are two basic themes in the book of Exodus, and this is going to be in the preaching. So when we met as elders, uh, we said we're going to preach something, and Mike said something with a lot that has a lot about Christ in it. 
And uh, so this is the book that really speaks about Christ indirectly. Okay? There's no promises about Christ in the book of Exodus. But the first theme is redemption, redeem. It's slave trade language. You go and you purchase a slave. You redeem them from the slave market. So the first theme is redemption that's portrayed in the Passover feast. Blood is spilled for the purchase. And the second theme is deliverance from oppression, portrayed in the exodus from Egypt onwards. This redemption and deliverance was accomplished through the shedding of blood. That first part, the redemption, is the shedding of blood. The second part is done by the power of God. So that's the two themes in the book of Exodus. Exodus was written to portray the birth of Israel as the nation that would bring God's rule on earth. I've already spoken about that. Genesis was all about God's rule on earth. Here we have again God starting afresh. That he wants his people to rule on earth. Of course we know that they failed. Exodus records the story of Israel's redemption under the leadership of Moses. So, when we talk about redemption here, we can't use a New Testament understanding of redemption because it's redemption under the leadership of Moses. What was redemption under the leadership of Moses? It was, it's a different idea of what you will have in the New Testament. It also serves as a, where it exposes the falsehood of idolatry and of course, it reveals that Yahweh is superior to all the so-called gods of Egypt. But one thing that's very clear is that Exodus teaches that God's people must be obedient. They must be obedient. For the redeemed and the set apart people of God is given instruction to obey. Here's a fact. If you do not obey scripture, you're going to slide away. If you don't obey God's word, you are going to slide away and you're going to depart. You are going to leave. Obedience, we don't obey to be saved. We obey because we are saved. Obedience needs to happen out of thankfulness to God. What are the key words then in Exodus? We've already spoken about redemption. Listen to how God communicates this. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I'm the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Just think of this. The, the, the idea that God has was, was for Israel to be this example this city on a hill, this light to the nations. It was, um, we've been redeemed. Um, let the light shine. But shine, not much light came out of Israel. There was not much light that came. Another key, the key chapter in the book of Exodus the climax of the entire Old Testament is recorded in chapter 12 to 14. The whole story about the, the Passover. How um, God um, would, just the picture of 
a little lamb being taken in a few days into the house and poor people, poor Israelites could share the lamb and, um, and then this lamb will be killed and the blood will be put on the doorpost. And you have this little ping of light going off. Here is an innocent victim uh, saving lives through blood. And that is the central theme of the Passover. Now, we have to remember, they didn't say, oh, there's Jesus. They didn't say that. This was the instruction given to them. This was pointing forward to something. Now, they already knew from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that the Redeemer was going to come, the seed was going to come. Here's another picture, and they are, it's through blood that they are redeemed. They didn't immediately see the Lord Jesus Christ, but here was a kind of hint, a type that would come in the future. And then, of course, they went through, we see the power of God as they go through the Red Sea. Only God can do that. And so the Exodus is the central event of the Old Testament as the cross is the central event in the New Testament. Now, is Christ there in Exodus? Exodus contains no direct messianic prophecies, but it is full of types and shadows or portraits of Christ. And here are seven. First of all, Moses is a type. In dozens of ways, Moses is a type of Christ. Let's turn to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, verse 15. Here... Moses is speaking <coughs> to the people before they go into the land. It's also the land where the Messiah will come. Look what he says. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. Up to that point, here we have Moses is both Christ and Moses were prophets. But then he makes a distinction. He makes a change and he adds something to them. But when he comes, the one like me, from your countrymen, so it will be from Israel, you shall listen to him. So you, you will not listen to Moses anymore. You will listen to Messiah when he comes. So both Moses and Christ are prophets. They declare the word of God. They are priest and kings. Although Moses was never made king, he functioned as a ruler in Israel. Both are king, king, kinsmen redeemers, which means a male relative who has the privilege or responsibility to act for a relative who was in trouble. Moses was part of Israel, and he knew it. And so he was this kinsman redeemer, there's a connection there and a, a, a kind of type sharing type with Christ. Both of them were endangered in infancy. Jesus had to flee to Egypt. Moses' mom put him in a little basket because they were killing all the boys of two years down. So you, you, you start seeing, but it's a type. Christ is not there. But there's a type, there's, a, there's something coming that is, there are similarities. Both of them were vulnerable and renounced their power and wealth. Moses fled Egypt, he went away, he came back, he associated with the people. He was brought up in uh, Pharaoh's palace. The Lord Jesus Christ, we read about in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, um, that he didn't consider equality with God something to hold on to, all his privileges, but he emptied himself. We see that there are, um, 
that Moses is sharing uh, this with, with Christ. Uh, both are deliverers. Both are lawgivers. There's the law of Moses and there's the law of Christ. And they're both mediators. Moses spoke to God. And Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. So we see these types, these shadows, these portraits. The Passover is another shadow. Make it clear that Christ is our slain God and the Passover lamb. Now we have to understand when we read the book of Exodus. They didn't make the connection. They didn't make the connection. They didn't know. And that is why we find the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 24 actually going and he makes it. He, he peels it back for them and he says he showed them from the law and the prophets and the Psalms what it said about him. So the Passover, let us go to John chapter 1 verse 29. Here's a, a type that is explained in Scripture. Here's a type that is explained in Scripture. You see, the danger of looking for Christ in, in any of the New Testament thing is that you can say this is Christ, but Scripture doesn't confirm it. Here we have, in John chapter 1, verse 29, is confirming it. So it is making the connection for us. We don't have to go do our own little Christology. Okay? Let me use an, an example. It gets so bad when people do that. They will go to, uh, is it Isaiah, where it says, holy, holy, holy. God is holy, 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 three times. They say, you see? Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You cannot make that jump. It's gymnastics that doesn't work. You're going to break your neck. Hebrew doesn't have a way of expressing intensity. The only way it ha has is to repeat the word three times. So he's very, very holy. That's all it means. So reading Christ into everything is you're just going to end up with the New Testament at the end. Um, John chapter 1 verse 29 says this. Uh, the next day he saw Jesus, as is John the Baptist, coming to him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What was he referring to? He is the Lamb of God that covers our sin. He is, uh, there's, these, they are going to receive all of these uh, pictures in the law, what they need to do about the lamb. He didn't really take away, but the Passover, did, the blood did protect Egypt, it did, um, Israel, it did cover them uh, from, protected them against the wrath of God. Then there are the seven feasts, there are seven feasts in the book of Exodus, and um, Silhia did a good job on Pentecost showing the one feast Passover feast, the fulfillment, how Jesus fulfills those feasts, that will be there. The Exodus itself, Paul relates baptism to the Exodus event because baptism symbolizes death to the old and identification with the new. And of course we read about uh, the Exodus, they went, they were baptized in the Red Sea. Then manna and water, Jesus makes this connection in John chapter 6 verse 31, the manna he was referring to himself um, giving life and coming from heaven. John chapter 6 verse 31. Um, Our father ate the manna in the wilderness. As, he, as it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. He's referring to himself as uh, the manna. 
And of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we have that as well. The tabernacle was a structure, a movable structure, a not a permanent structure, a tent that was built in the wilderness. And in John chapter 1 verse 14, John makes the connection, but we don't see the word tabernacle there, but I'm going to read it to you and then I'll explain. It says in John chapter 1 verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt there is tabernacle. So immediately when you read John, you oh, okay. So the Bible is making the connection for us, you, referring to a type. So even the materials, the colors, the furniture, the arrangement of the tabernacle, um, even all of that speaks of the person of Christ and the way of redemption. The development is progressive from suffering, blood and death and beauty and holiness and the glory of God. And uh, the tabernacle was really visible theology. Visible theology in physical form, if they were explained, if it was explained to Israel, they would have understood redemption. They would have understood that salvation, to be saved, it requires blood. It requires um, washing, that which represents sanctification. All of these these things, but of course, what I love this, this whole idea of the high priest, and um, uh, you know, there are many of this is revealed in the book of Exodus in several ways. The high priest foreshadows the ministry of Christ, our great high priest, but it's different. It's not the. It was to communicate something that wasn't fulfilled. There was. If you read the book of Exodus, it is there's kind of a unsettledness in the Old Testament because they are promised that the Messiah will come, but nothing is fulfilled. Nothing is permanent. I mean, the animals don't really take away the the blood of sheep doesn't take away the our sin. And it's so costly. If you sin, man, it's going to cost you your best goat. Because it needs to be unblemished. So sin is very costly. So there's a cry, there's an expectation, but this doesn't really fulfill. And so when you read the book of Exodus and when you hear preaching on it, you need to hear that frustration. Because it's the old covenant, it's not the new covenant. It's only with Christ when he's the once and for all sacrifice, the just for the unjust, where it's fulfilled. It is now brought about, the reality, the shadow has become a reality for us to, to trust in. What contribution did the book of Exodus make? If you take the book of Exodus out of the Bible, you have no Israel. Because there are many, the religious ceremonies, the customs of Israel, the creation of the tabernacle, the formation of the priesthood, the Mosaic law, the sacrificial system, Exodus is foundational for following the history of Israel. It describes how the Israelites escaped from Egypt, became the covenant people of God, and came to know his presence and his way. But they can only know his presence, his way. Now this doesn't exist anymore. The temple doesn't exist. Um, and this theocracy... It's not a democracy. You know what a democracy is. A theocracy. God is in control here. Um, was all built on all the ceremonies and the buildings and the constructions and, and all of that. Exodus stands at the heart of the Old Testament as the greatest example of the saving act of God before Christ. So we need to preach that. And when you preach that, you will hear the frustration. Now, 
I, I said to someone the other day, why do we preach the frustration that's in the book of Exodus? Because there are many Christians who live today who live as if he hasn't come. And it might just be that frustration for you to realize, but he has come. I don't have to be expecting for another Messiah to come. I don't have to kind of try my best to be saved. Messiah has come. And uh, there's a lot of those things that relate to us today. It provides the framework for the rest of the Old Testament message. The Passover, the Exodus, Moses, the law, and the tabernacle dominated the thought of Israel for, for centuries to come. So, just a survey again here. It's God's power, his redemptive act. Um, he liberates his people. Now, it's interesting in South America, liberation theology has taken, uh, you will find liberation theology in the church, but it's a lot here in South Africa as well. They would take this story and they will apply it to our liberation. Uh, if people were oppressed, they will use the book of Exodus. So they will preach, they will preach it through a specific grid. And uh, they would say, you know, God's the God of liberation. And if you worship the true God, he will liberate you from all oppression. In the New Testament, we don't find that. We, we just preached this morning about Christians experiencing great suffering. And how should they suffer? So you, you can't twist the book to suit what you wanted to say. And, and it has happened. Um, so just in closure, um, here we find God's faithfulness. And it fulfills the promise made to Abraham centuries before. And God is on the move here. And then, of course, all the other four books with Exodus is going to bring all of that about. Okay. Um, so that is the introduction to the book of uh, Exodus. If you are interested in that documentary just to look at how the world has adapted and refused to um, uh, acknowledge the evidences that are there, please please send me a link. I was just talking to Mike before we began. Uh, the UN has uh, made a declaration that the Jews do not belong in Israel. Now, whether you care for the Jews or whether you don't care for the Jews, there are evidences everywhere that, um, that, they, that they are, that's their land. God has given it to them. Um, they failed as a nation. They need to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, even though there are many who want to rebuild the temple and they want to institute sacrifices and kind of establish a theocracy. So we are going to look over the next few months in the book of Exodus how it speaks to us. Because 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is profitable for teaching, even for New Testament Goyim. New Testament Gentiles. All scripture is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. So please pray for us as we uh, take this on. It's a narrative. It's telling a story. It's a different kind of preaching. Uh, there are major themes here. It brings, really brings the, the Redeemer, God, to the forefront. It shows how... God works to save his people. That's, you see God. But, just think of it for a moment. This is my closing thought. Every verse in the five books of Moses and right in the Old Testament has what is called a fallen condition focus. Every single verse. I'm going to explain it. It means that all of it, Every single verse refers to this point, makes a statement. We are fallen, and we are in need of being redeemed. The whole Old Testament is like that. Um, so every single verse has that DNA in it. There's, we are fallen people. Mankind is fallen. 
Their condition is a fallen condition. That's the focus. That's why it's written for our attention. And Paul makes this statement in Romans chapter 3. We can conclude that all men, whether a Jew or Gentile, and then he says, everyone's fallen. And he concludes, how do we as Gentiles know that the Jews are? Well, we just read Exodus. We read the Old Testament and we see, I'm just like them. I tend to leave the God I love. And he needs to bring me back. He needs to redeem me. I need to know his, his, his word. He takes the initiative to save me. And so that would be the, that's really the mesh that keeps the Old Testament together. It's that fallen condition focus. And you need to understand that in order to read the, the Old Testament. They've fallen, they're waiting for redemption to come. Redemption came, but it wasn't the redemption. It was redemption, and we're going to see God in the midst of that. Well, why don't we pray, and then we can go directly into having some fellowship. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are the only Redeemer, the Savior of the world. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for the mercy that you show us, keeping away from us what we deserve, and stretching your hand out to us who don't deserve it, making us yours, um, not because we've done anything, but because you have thought it out. You have made the decision yourself. We thank you for that. And as we enter into the book of Exodus and we see all the names and the rich history, as it moves towards Christ coming to save people, we pray that we may understand something about the expectation. That we may understand something about the expectation and things knowing we are gods, but it's not really working as we wish it would. Just a costly system of blood and sacrifice centered around the temple with laws. So we pray, Lord, uh, that we will, through the restrictions and the unfulfillment, develop this, this great thankfulness that Christ has come, that he has saved us, that we are his, and he has promised that his redemption is enough. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for an unusual evening and being here and listening to some of this information.